A diesel electric sub, the Goland has been called, quote, one of the most advanced submarines in the world. It's also one of the few non nuclear submarines capable of staying underwater for weeks at a time rather than days. Its biggest claim to. Olá pessoal, bem-vindos a mais um vídeo nesse canal. Nós somos cidadãos do terceiro mundo e nesse canal a gente reage e aprende sobre o primeiro mundo. Nesse vídeo a gente vai reagir a o que a Suécia vai trazer para a OTAN. Então pedimos que por favor você considere se inscrever, ative as notificações e deixe mais sugestões aqui embaixo nos comentários. E agora vamos para a reação. It will be the moment when 200 years of defense policy are ripped up. A shift in Northern Europe so seismic it will almost have to be measured on the Richter scale. Since the end of the Napoleonic era, Sweden has maintained a policy of strict neutrality. In both World War I and World War II, Stockholm managed to keep itself apart from the bloodshed. Throughout the Cold War, the Swedes likewise remained independent of the great two blocs, wearing their non-aligned status as a badge of honor. Last year, though, that neutral stance finally evaporated. Following Vladimir Putin's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, Sweden's government applied alongside Finland to join NATO. At the time of recording, that application is still being held up by Hungary and Turkey, but most analysts believe Stockholm will eventually become NATO's 32nd member. And that raises a vital question. What will Sweden bring to the alliance? On paper, a country of 10.4 million peaceniks might not sound like a great addition. Yet while Sweden's standing army might be small, the military punch is way above its weight. In domains as disparate as cyber, air, and naval capacity, Stockholm commands serious forces. Forces we're going to analyze in today's video. For anyone following European news, May the 18th, 2022, was a day that offered a lot of action. In Ukraine, hundreds of defenders of the Azov-style plant surrendered, bringing a close to one of the war's earliest major battles. Up in Kiev, the first Russian soldier to be tried for war crimes appeared before a local court. But it arguably wasn't on the battlefields of Ukraine that the biggest story was unfolding, but nearly 2,000 kilometers away in a wood-paneled room in Brussels. There, the ambassadors from Finland and Sweden jointly handed application letters to NATO Secretary Jen Stoltenberg. In doing so, they transformed the security architecture of Europe for decades to come. Prior to this moment, the two Nordic nations had been famous for their non-alignment. On our earlier video on Finland and NATO, we described how Helsinki had maintained neutrality for nearly 75 years. But what was a massive psychological shift for the Finns was on a whole other level for the Swedes. While Finland had been steadfastly neutral for over seven decades, Sweden had clung to its non-aligned status for over two centuries. Beginning in the last years of the wow. Napoleonic Wars, when Stockholm was forced to cede Finland to Russia after the Finnish War, that neutrality had survived some of the greatest conflagrations to sweep Europe. Even the continent-wide murder-suicide pact that was World War II managed to leave the Swedes relatively unscathed, and the Cold War was nothing if not a demonstration of how a non-aligned Sweden could happily prosper. The key question is, what changed? What about the present moment is so volatile that Stockholm feels more vulnerable than it ever did during the era of Blitzkrieg? And on the face of it, well, the answer seems pretty simple. Vladimir Putin's genocidal war in Ukraine has overturned decades of defense planning in Europe, sending non-NATO countries racing for the shelter of the nuclear umbrella. But that's only the surface level answer, the catalyst for this shift rather than the underlying cause. Unlike Finland, Sweden shares no land border with Russia. It has no significant Russian-speaking population that Vladimir Putin might want to protect. More to the point, Stockholm went the entire Cold War without feeling the need for a nuclear umbrella, comfortable in its ability to defend itself. And it's here that we get to the deeper level answer for Sweden wanting to abandon its neutrality. The steady erosion of the nation's defense capacity. The key to Sweden's non-aligned status was a policy variously known as deterrence through strength or heavily armed neutrality. Similar to what Taiwan's military plan is now called the Porcupine Strategy, the idea was to make Sweden such a nightmare to conquer that even the Soviet Union would judge the costs to be vastly outweighing the benefits. Like Finland, that meant maintaining a conscription model that provided a highly trained reserve force that could be activated at a moment's notice. In Sweden's eu acredito que o que aconteceu atualmente é, na Rússia é algo que deixou muitos países realmente preocupados, porque a Rússia acabou tomando uma atitude em relação a outro país, né, e a gente viu o que está acontecendo nos últimos anos na Ucrânia, então 
Acho que muitos países passaram a se preocupar. É verdade, especialmente países que estão tão próximos, né? E mesmo que não compartilhem uma fronteira, querendo ou não, eles estão muito próximos da Rússia. Sim. Em esse caso, isso forçou total 850,000 men. Como like a Finlândia, também pensou em investir em weaponry fora do que uma nação de tamanho normal pode ser normalizada. Unlike with Finland, though, Sweden's heavily armed neutrality didn't survive the biggest geopolitical shift of the last 35 years, the end of the Cold War. While Helsinki continued to maintain a vast reserve army, Stockholm allowed it to wither in the soft glow of peace. The defense budget was slashed, the funds redirected, the Navy and Air Force shrank by around 70%, the army by a staggering 90%. In no time at all, that 850,000 strong reserve force had dropped to a mere 10,000. By the mid 2010s, the military had seen such deep cuts that garrisons were being shuttered, even in regions vital to the nation's defense, like the island of Gotland. Conscription had been scrapped, military spending dropped to barely a single percentage point of GDP. All of this on the back of the idea that peace in Europe was here to stay. And of course, we all know what happened next. On February the 24th, 2022, Vladimir Putin unleashed his assault on Ukraine. As missiles pounded Kiev, it was like the lights had finally flicked back on at Europe's post-Cold War party. And Sweden was among those nations sheepishly caught with its trousers down. As director of studies at the Swedish Defense Research Agency, Robert Dalsio bluntly told the New York Times, We had our dream, and now it's time to wake up. Given all that, you might now be under the impression that Stockholm is going to be a drag on the alliance, that the Swedes are running for NATO protection because their modern military consists of two guys called Bjorn driving an armored Volvo. But I acho muito interessante porque a gente vê que é, a Suécia tem se é, tem permanecido neutro durante muito tempo, mas agora num momento como esse, um momento muito preocupante, eles mostram que estão atentos ao que está acontecendo e também a proteger o país e os cidadãos deles. Então, isso é um ponto que chama a atenção, porque se for preciso defender, eles vão defender. Sim, sem dúvidas. Inclusive, isso, a entrada desses novos países pode ser com que uma verba passe a crescer mais, porque eles vão passar, a, talvez, a influenciar economicamente. Na, na OTAN, é, principalmente se a gente levar em consideração de que se tratam de países ricos. Verdade. That impression couldn't be more wrong, because while Stockholm doubtless regrets its deep military cuts, that doesn't mean the Swedes have nothing to offer. What the Nordic Kingdom lacks in manpower, it more than makes up for with cutting-edge technology. When we did our Finland video, one of the very few problems we highlighted was Helsinki's lack of a solid defense industrial base. In a war of attrition, Finland would become quickly dependent on other NATO allies for resupply. In Sweden, the situation is more or less reversed. While its tiny standing army and reserve forces wouldn't even be arounding Eric compared to what Helsinki can field, Stockholm has the capacity to produce both small arms and high-tech defensive kit. So much so that Sweden is both one of the world's leading arms exporters and one of the largest arms manufacturers per capita. But this kit isn't just built for foreign markets. In pretty much all domain, Stockholm is able to combine internationally purchased kit with homegrown weapons platforms to compete with the best. Let's start with the Swedish Navy. While relatively small compared to other coastal nations, Sweden fields a navy with an excellent reputation for stealth. Central to this is the domestically produced Gotland class of submarines, of which five are currently known to be in operation. A diesel-electric sub, the Gotland has been called, quote, one of the most advanced submarines in the world. It's also one of the few non-nuclear submarines capable of staying underwater for weeks at a time rather than days. Its biggest claim to fame wow. comes from war games conducted with the USA in 2005. In a mock-up battle, one Gotland sub managed to score direct hits on the $6 billion aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan without ever being detected. This, despite the Americans fielding anti-submarine escorts and an entire carrier task force. The anecdote nicely demonstrates the stealth capacity of the Swedish Navy, a capacity that carries over into the Visby class corvettes. Essentially, Sweden's warships, the five Visbys, are designed to remain hidden to enemy radar, undetectable at range, even as they pack some serious firepower, like the naval gun Bofors 57mm Mark III. These are locally designed and built machines, armed mostly with weapons built by Swedish firms, principally Saab Bofors Dynamics. 
And yeah, that's the same Saab that used to be best known for building cars. Today, they're apparently more focused on supplying NATO armies than ensuring a comfortable drive to IKEA. Still, this defense industrial base doesn't mean the Swedes don't also buy from partner countries. The army's main battle tank, for example, comes from Germany. Stockholm is something in the region of 120 Leopard 2A tanks. Wow. Air defense likewise relies on foreign tech. In 2021, Sweden became the first non-NATO nation to receive Patriot systems from the US. Yet, even in the domains where they're happy to rely on outside systems, the Swedes still produce their own powerful machines. Those 120 Leopard 2As, they're backed by something in the region of 500 CV-90 infantry fighting vehicles, among the best in their class in the entire world. It's stuff like this that demonstrates why Sweden's tiny army is not to be taken lightly. In the answer shooting war between... Eu acredito que, como a Suécia é um país muito rico, é, tudo que eles vão fazer é, vai ser de muita qualidade. Então, eles têm um exército muito poderoso, porque eles têm a capacidade de estar tá investindo nisso, né? Investindo dinheiro nisso. Sim, concordo com você. E esse fator econômico é algo que vai fazer muita diferença. E como eu mencionei anteriormente, eles podem ajudar também no desenvolvimento da OTAN como uma organização, no sentido de estarem também ajudando economicamente. A gente consegue perceber aqui que mesmo é, que eles sejam um país rico, eles ainda compram de outros países. Então é muito interessante que eles estejam optando por fortalecer a defesa deles. NATO and Russia, Stockholm's homegrown equipment, designed with the frigid climate of North Europe in mind, would be instrumental in securing the alliance's northern flank. This includes in the cyber domain. Unlike most Western countries, Sweden has been actively pursuing offensive cyber capabilities for years. As the Atlantic Council wrote in 2022, if recent exercises are any indicator, Swedish cyber capabilities are already among the most advanced in Europe. Really, though, it's not wow. for Sweden's cyber efforts that NATO is desperate to get Stockholm in the door. Nor is it for what the army or navy feels impressive as their kit is. No, there is one single domain where the Swedes really shine. One area where their expertise and equipment could make a crucial difference in any Europe-wide conflagration. We're talking, of course, about the Swedish Air Force. Anyone watching CNN last May might have been surprised when a segment aired calling Sweden one of the world's top-ranked air forces. After all, this is a country with only 10.4 million citizens, a nation with a GDP on par with Ireland. This is on a continent that boasts the British RAF, the French Air Force, and Italy's sizable Aeronautica Militare. So the idea that tiny Sweden can compete in the air should be laughable. It should be, but it isn't, because CNN wasn't just indulging in cable news hyperbole. Stockholm really does possess an air force that could put many of its peers to shame. The main reason for this is the nation's homemade fighter jet, the Gripen JAS-39. Designed when the Cold War was still ongoing, Gripens had to work to a very specific set of requirements. They had to be cheap, since Sweden couldn't pour the sort of resources into its combat craft that America or NATO could. They had to be easy to operate and reliable, less flashy than stuff like the F-16, but also requiring less maintenance. Finally, they had to be capable of short takeoffs and landings, since Swedish defense plans called for following dispersed operations doctrine in the event of war. In practical terms, that meant pilots had to be able to fly sorties from remote roads in the Swedish wilderness where an invading force would be hard-pressed to find and destroy them. The result was a machine that Aviazzi Online describes as a small but competent fighter, a robust, cost-effective weapons platform capable of doing serious damage. Those capabilities have only improved since the Cold War ended. Today, 1C Gripen C varieties are equipped with MBDA Meteor long-range air-to-air missiles and a cutting-edge active electronically scanned array system. The most modern E-variety Gripens are even capable of supercruise flight, placing them in a rare group alongside craft like the F-22 Raptor, the Eurofighter Typhoon, or France's Dassault Rafale. In short, these are craft that compete at an international level, so much so that heavy-hitter nations like Brazil rely on them to protect air power. Currently, Sweden has nearly 100 of them, 75 C variants, 22 C to D variants, and just two of the ultra-modern E variants, though some 58 more E craft are scheduled to be delivered in the near future. All C and D aircraft are also planned to undergo upgrades that will keep them working and relevant through to 2035, when the whole fleet will be replaced with newer models. So, yeah, there's good reason people seriously into combat aircraft have a secret soft spot for Sweden's Air Force. 
But combat crafts aren't the only things a modern air power needs. They're also the less sexy, but still vital functions like airborne early warning and control craft and intelligence gathering vessels. And well, Sweden shines here too. As Defense News recently reported, Stockholm is set to buy two of Saab's new Global Eye AWNC craft. According to the manufacturer, Global Eye, quote, combine air, maritime, and ground surveillance on a single platform, all in real time. To that, you can also add two Gulfstream 4 aircraft modified for intelligence gathering. Now, we don't want to turn this entire chapter into a geeky lovin' for Sweden's Air Force, or for you to leave with the impression that Stockholm could project air power on a similar level to a nation like the USA. It's absolutely not the case. Even Sweden's own generals wouldn't try to claim that. Their Air Force, for example, has a clear and noticeable weakness where large transport craft are concerned, fielding only five C-130H Hercules. It's hardly anything for NATO to get excited about. But what we're trying to do is paint a clear picture of a nation that consistently punches several classes above its weight in the air domain. A country that won't be a drag on NATO, but a worthy addition to its northern flank. Not that the alliance would be in much of a position to reject Sweden, even if its military offered nothing more than flat pack furniture and uh, ABBA tribute bands. And that's because Sweden, the nation, represents something NATO can't afford to ignore. Something that has nothing to do with technology or defense industrial bases. And that's a way to project NATO power in two vital bodies of water. Uau, eu fiquei realmente impressionado. Eles têm um poder aéreo muito forte de defesa. É isso é realmente algo impressionante, ao ponto de fazer com que outras regiões, outros países, realmente reconhecessem isso, né? Então isso é realmente algo impressionante. Sim, é verdade. Me impressiona isso e me impressiona também o fato que eles são muito bons em defesa cibernética. Isso é uma coisa que é muito importante hoje, principalmente numa época que a gente tem tudo assim no computador, né, na internet. Então, realmente é importante isso. Você vê que eles estão muito avançados nisso. E isso é uma coisa incrível, né? É, mas vindo de um país rico, isso é algo que não chega a ser uma grande surpresa. Sim, verdade. One of Vladimir Putin's stated reasons for unleashing his war on Ukraine uh, was to halt the further expansion of NATO. As many have noted, his actions ironically had the... Isso é algo muito interessante, porque ele realmente disse isso, e a gente está vendo que está dando um efeito contrário. É, isso é realmente algo muito interessante exact opposite effect. When Finland joined the alliance on April the 4th, 2023, it's more than doubled the land border that Russia shares with NATO. But even that strategic blunder may pale compared to Sweden joining. Or if or when Stockholm is finally admitted to the alliance, it will transform the Baltic Sea from a region bordered by members and non-members alike into little more than a NATO lake. If you look at a map of the alliance from before the Ukraine war, you'll see an obvious weak point. The mere 65 kilometer strip of land connecting the Baltic states with the rest of the alliance. As we covered in our earlier video, Finland's accession eliminated that problem, creating a straightforward way to resupply Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania via sea. Sweden's accession, though, will go one step further. Further. Rather than eliminate the problem, it'll flip it around, creating a world in which the Baltic Sea suddenly becomes Moscow's obvious weak point. If you look at that map again, with Sweden and Finland both in NATO, oh, we can see that Russia only has a couple of tiny strips from which it can access the Baltic Sea. Two strategic choke points that the alliance could potentially blockade. The first is in the Gulf of Finland, the strip of water separating Finland and Estonia. A blockade here would not only cut off St. Petersburg from the sea, it would also trap the Russian Baltic fleet in port at Kronstadt. The second is the water around Kaliningrad, a Russian exclave bordering Poland and Lithuania. Just 200 kilometers from Sweden, it houses one of Russia's only ice-free ports, as well as a serious military base. But given any ships trying to exit will have to pass through both Denmark and Sweden, its use would evaporate in wartime. Especially when you take into account Sweden's nearby island, Gotland. A strip of land a hair under 3,000 square kilometers, Gotland has been called an unsinkable aircraft carrier, a place from where a military could dominate maritime and air traffic over the Baltic Sea. 
As such, it's long been a premier Russian target. Back in the Cold War, Swedish spies uncovered Soviet plans to occupy the island in the event of war, Sweden's neutrality be damned. Closer to our time, Gotland was the subject of a jingoistic Russian documentary broadcast on the eve of the Ukraine war, one which described how Moscow could capture it alongside Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. For this reason, Stockholm long kept a mighty military presence there. During the Cold War, 25,000 troops guarded the place, with another 25,000 in reserve. Harbors were filled with mines, 25 fixed artillery pieces, and 36 tanks were ready and waiting for a potential battle. But the peacetime cuts destroyed all of that. Today, Gotland is protected by only three to 400 soldiers. The coastal defenses have been dismantled. The submarine base, incredibly, was almost sold to a Russian businessman. Although Sweden is rapidly trying oh. to remilitarize the island, it's currently a weak link, a place Russia's forces at Kalingrad would almost certainly try to seize in the opening hours of a full-blown conflict. If Sweden joins NATO, though, Gotland could go from being a potential problem to a potential lifesaver, a place the alliance's forces could fortify and use to dominate the entire Baltic Sea. With fellow NATO member Turkey also capable of closing the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits, Russia could quickly find most of its European ports cut off from the wider world. Most, but not all of them. Up in the far north, ports like Mamansk would still have access to the Atlantic via the Arctic Ocean. And that brings us neatly to another reason why NATO wants Sweden on side. Admit the Swedes to the club, and every Arctic nation not called Russia will be an alliance member. There are eight Arctic nations in the world. Canada, the USA, Denmark via Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Of these, Russia controls the majority of the Arctic coastline, slightly over 50%. It has also invested heavily in military infrastructure in the region. As the planet warms and Arctic ice begins to recede, the region is only going to become more important to shipping. At the same time, energy and mineral resources are going to become available to exploit. That means the chance of confrontation in these waters will increase. As the Council on Foreign Relations has put it, having seven of eight border nations in NATO, quote, allows the alliance to pursue a more coherent strategy in the region. This is potentially vital for both European and American interests, not just because of Russia, but because of another nation that's expanding operations there. China has plans to create a so-called Polar Silk Road using the Northern Sea Route, massively increasing Beijing's influence and power in what's becoming a highly contested region. For US lawmakers looking to try and contain China, a NATO-dominated Arctic is one of the few ways of countering the CCP's northern plans. At this stage, though, uh, we're still just looking at ways Swedish membership could potentially benefit NATO, and interesting as this is, there's a whole other aspect we really do need to consider. And that's just how compatible are Stockholm and NATO going to be? Wow! Ele está passando muitas informações, ele, ele aproveita essa oportunidade para falar mais sobre a, a questão da Suécia nesse sentido, né? de defesa e, e coisas do tipo, mas ele é muito interessante que ele tocou no ponto em relação à China, que é um país que realmente está em constante crescimento, não numa questão geográfica, mas numa questão econômica e também de investimentos tecnológicos. É verdade e que é, é, cada vez mais a gente vê que a China está entrando em muitos países, né? principalmente a questão é, da produção. Mas que eu acho muito interessante que ele também falou sobre isso é uma questão estratégica, porque vários países ali próximo à Rússia estão aderidos à OTAN. Então é uma coisa que é muito complicada para a Rússia, né? Porque daqui a pouco eles vão tá, estar cercados de países que fazem parte da OTAN. E com certeza isso não é uma coisa positiva para eles. Eu vejo que a Suécia está fazendo parte também dessa estratégia, né? Aderindo agora à OTAN. Although they cooperated closely as non-aligned countries, the ambivalence felt towards NATO in Stockholm and Helsinki was not identical. The Finns had living memories of Russian aggression in the form of the Winter War fought between their nation and the Soviet Union in World War II. So when Putin's Russia finally showed its true colors, Finland was almost immediately ready to throw its lot in with NATO. By March 2022, polling showed that over 60% of Finns wanted to be part of the alliance, a number that eventually rose to over 80%. In Sweden, though, things weren't quite so clear-cut. With no Russian land border and no personal memories of Russian aggression, Stockholm was ambivalent about ending its neutrality. As late as mid-March, Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson was saying she saw no need to apply to NATO. The public, too, were unsure. Even in April 2022, polls were showing fewer than half of all Swedes supported entering the alliance. 
To put that in perspective, this was after the discovery of Russian war crimes at Bucha, when the world already knew of the arbitrary torture, sexual assault, and murder Moscow's forces had visited upon civilians. For some, this reluctance to follow the Finns was ascribed to Swedish psychology, the idea that Swedes see themselves as natural peacemakers and a force for dialogue on the world stage. But this assessment skipped over one key point in the Sweden-NATO debate. The Swedish military had already been cooperating with the alliance for decades. The partnership between the two forces began almost immediately after the end of the Cold War, with the first steps being taken in 1992. By 1994, Sweden was an official member of the NATO Partnership for Peace program. Not long after, the two began conducting joint military exercises. In many ways, this step was practical. In 1995, both Sweden and Finland joined the EU, a move that included signing a mutual defense clause. With many EU members already in NATO, uh, working with the alliance would clearly be necessary in any continent-wide war. Yet Sweden's cooperation with NATO would go deeper than what was strictly necessary. As we mentioned earlier, Stockholm received equipment from the alliance, becoming the first non-member to host a Patriot system. Not only that, but it also joined NATO on active missions. The NATO force in Kosovo, K4, has included Swedish troops, as have NATO forces in Afghanistan and Iraq. During the 2011 intervention in Libya, Sweden's air force was involved in enforcing the no-fly zone. According to the Dutch magazine Militaire Spectator, during the mission, quote, Swedish aircraft seamlessly integrated with NATO air forces. In other words, Sweden isn't some outside force coming into NATO, not knowing the difference between Article 5 and a piece of pickled herring. It's a rather a nation that has spent decades now hovering on the threshold of membership without ever quite stepping through the door. That doesn't mean there won't be issues when or if Stockholm is allowed in the club. Wow, isso realmente é muito interessante. Eu tô achando bem interessante esse vídeo porque ele está sendo muito, ele está trazendo muitas informações interessantes de coisas que a gente realmente não sabia. É, eu não tinha ideia sobre boa parte das coisas que são ditas aqui, mas ele comenta sobre essa questão é, da Suécia e da Suécia serem vistos como um povo mais pacificador. Mas eu acho que realmente num momento como esse não dá para você ficar tendo uma postura é, que você tem já há, há muito tempo em tempos que não são tão turbulentos. É, eu realmente não sei por que, que eles não, é, esse, é, se mantiveram é, mais neutros em relação a outros momentos que também tiveram momentos tão turbulentos de guerra e agora resolver aderir, mas eu vejo como isso uma coisa sendo natural diante de como o mundo está hoje. Então é, é muito mais esperado que os países tentem de alguma forma se proteger e proteger seu povo do que não fazer isso. Embora mesmo um país que é, que é e continua sendo pacífico como a Suécia. Just to take one example, NATO countries commit to spending a minimum of 2% of GDP on defense. While only 7 of the 31 members actually hit that target, most are at least spending over 1.5%. Sweden, on the other hand, spent a mere 1.2% in 2022. Within the alliance, that would make it one of the lowest spending members, ahead of only Luxembourg, Spain, and Belgium. And while there are plans to boost spending by billions of dollars, it will take a minimum until 2028 for Sweden to come close to the 2% target. Despite all of this, though, it seems today that Sweden may finally be ready to step over that membership threshold to become NATO's 32nd member. Back in May of 2022, polling reported a majority of Swedes wanted to join the alliance for the first time in history. Since then, that number has only grown, not to the sky-high levels that have been seen in Finland, but to a solid 60%, which is a solid majority by any stretch. The new government under Ulf Christensen has followed this shift. On March the 23rd, 2023, the Riksdagen voted to join NATO. 296 lawmakers were in favor, only 37 were against. But this doesn't mean it's a done deal. At the time of recording, alliance members Turkey and Hungary are both withholding approval of Sweden's accession, a major deal since joining NATO requires unanimity. It could even be that this approval never comes and Stockholm is left eternally out in the cold. No longer neutral by choice, but forced by politics in Ankara and Budapest to remain non-aligned. Mas é muito surpreendente que é, a Suécia investindo pouco mais de 1% do PIB nessa questão da defesa, eles já conseguem fazer tantas coisas. Eu fico imaginando se eles investirem mais. O quanto eles não vão poder ter né? muito mais poder, porque já é um país muito poderoso. 
Investindo somente isso. Imagine se investirem mais. But this seems unlikely. Right now, the smart money is on Turkey and Hungary eventually dropping their objections. When they do, NATO will at last admit its 32nd member, a member that has a lot to give. Now, as we've hopefully shown in today's video, Sweden's membership isn't a magic bullet for the alliance, nor is it the equivalent to inviting in a major power on the scale of the US or even France. What it is, though, is a win for NATO on multiple fronts, a much needed boost from a military that may be small, but plays to its strengths with deadly precision. A military that can help ensure safety and security in Europe for generations to come. Wow, wow realmente, um... que vídeo interessante. Eu gostei muito desse vídeo. É um vídeo um pouco diferente que a gente trouxe para reagir aqui. Mas acho que tudo isso é um pouco resultado do que está acontecendo, do que a Rússia está fazendo. Porque até aconteceu o que eles fizeram com a Ucrânia, tudo estava aparentemente bem. Acontece que as pessoas acabaram perdendo a confiança de achar que nada aconteceria. Então, como aconteceu, as pessoas começaram a olhar com uma certa desconfiança, não, confi não tendo mais confiança no, no que eles estão fazendo. Verdade, eu acho que o que aconteceu na Ucrânia foi a gota d'água, né? É, aquela invasão. É para realmente acontecer o que está acontecendo hoje, que é toda essa movimentação que a gente vê diariamente, né? Tem notícias e muitas delas são realmente assustadoras. Então, é, é natural que os países acabem tendo essa reação e realmente eu fiquei muito surpresa, até porque eu não sabia nada assim sobre essa questão de defesa da Suécia e me surpreendeu muito ver o quanto eles conseguem fazer e como eles conseguem também é, estar é, evoluídos né, à frente nessa questão também de defesa em relação à internet. Então, eu achei isso incrível, essas informações. E, de fato, é um vídeo muito informativo. Sem dúvidas. E essa foi a nossa reação, então se você gostou, aproveita para se inscrever, ativa as notificações e faça mais sugestões aqui embaixo nos comentários. Muito obrigado por ter assistido esse vídeo e a gente se vê na próxima reação. Tchau! Tchau.